Okay, we're looking tonight at message number one on throwing stones. I'm sure you've heard somebody say this sometime or another. People who live in house, glass houses should not throw stones. And uh, so I began studying what the Word of God says about judging. I've had a couple of challenges thrown at me recently by people saying, well, you shouldn't be judging. So I thought we'd look, see what the Bible says. Okay, so... There's an interesting phrase that appears all through the Bible, you've probably seen, is the phrase one another. And it appears in various forms. We're going to be looking at the uh, seventh chapter of Matthew, if you want to turn there. And uh, the various forms are one toward another, one against another, one another, and one to another. You see all of these different forms in the Bible. So it's a phrase which reflects upon the relationship between people. And some references are in the negative. Here are a couple of negative ones. Leviticus 19.11, you shall not steal nor deal falsely nor lie one to another. Leviticus 25.14, and if you sell or buy with your neighbor, you shall not oppress one another. 1 Corinthians 4.6, Paul says that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Romans 14.13, which we'll be looking at uh, next week let us not therefore judge one another anymore but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way so some of the references are negative some are also positive john 13 34 jesus said a new commandment i give unto you that you love one another even as i have loved you that you love one another Romans 13, 8, he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another fulfilleth the law. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Romans 15, 14 says, he writes and he says, I am persuaded of you that you are filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So the phrase one another is a phrase associated with building relationship. Now, one thing we all know, relationships thrive on truth, right? Because truthfulness is the only way to build trust in solid relationships. And if, you don't, if you're not truthful with somebody, then your relationship will suffer. Truth in relationship is expressed in two important ways in the passages we just read indicate that. One is confrontation. This involves identifying a pattern that needs to be changed, and it may be that you see that in another person, and if you go about it right, you might be able to help that person. And not only is confrontation used, but also conciliation. This involves encouraging another person to change something that's damaging his spiritual life. So truth, what is the truth? Well, the truth is... The Word of God, not human opinion, not psychologists, not psychiatrists, but the Word of God. God's Word teaches us both how to confront something that's wrong and how to comfort someone who is wrong. So in both confrontation and conciliation, God's Word has to be the standard that we follow. Otherwise, the relationship between believers is based on preference and not on truth. Over the years, I've heard people who have been confronted for obvious sins say this. Well, you know what the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. <laughs> and uh, this is, of course, taken out of context. And the person is so ignorant that he doesn't realize that he just judged me when he made the statement. <laughs> this reveals ignorance of the word of God. So... What I try to do with people like that, if they're receptive, is try to get them to say, well, hey, let's go back and look at that in context. Usually they don't want to do that because they're looking for an excuse to not be judged anyway. So I want to call your attention to a few verses within their actual full context, and we'll focus on this question. Should believers judge one another? And you may have also heard this cliche we mentioned earlier, people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. So I asked a person who used that on me recently, oh, you believe people who live in glass houses should not throw stones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, what does that mean? And the person looked at me and said, huh? 
<laughs> and I said, okay. And then some people quote Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans 14, 13, and they only quote the first half of the verse, which says this, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. If you read only that, didn't read the second part of the verse, and didn't look at the verses that went ahead or the verses that followed, you'd say, well, that, that person's right. We're not supposed to judge anybody. That's what you'd say, you know. Well, this is the type of conclusion that comes from what I call proof texting when they approach the Bible. And they do this rather than follow what we call a scientific analytical approach to the passage of Scripture. So the proof texting person, this is a person who has already decided what to believe and what he wants the Bible to say, and so he goes rummaging through the Bible to find any statement, he doesn't care about the context, that seems to support his position. I've worked in city missions over and over again, and every time a drunk would come staggering in and I'd try to help him, I'd say, let me see if I can help you with this uh, problem you have here. He said, well, you know, the Bible says take a little wine for your stomach's sake. And I said, well, that was written to Timothy who had gastrointestinal problems. And I said, uh, there are a couple of problems there. First of all, it doesn't look like you've been taking a little. And I said, then the second problem is no doctor is going to prescribe alcohol for gastrointestinal problems. The third problem is, is you don't know what the word wine is in the Bible. Sometimes it refers to non-intoxicating grape juice. It's like our modern word beverage. So a proof texting person is basically dishonest with the scripture. They just want to try to find some authority to back them up. So they lift Romans 14, 13 and Matthew 7, 1 out of the context and says, see, you shouldn't be judging me. Little do you realize now that as soon as he says that, he's actually judging. And that's a level of shallowness that you really can't reason with. And by the way, here's an interesting principle. If you've been saved any length of time at all and you still have a shallow approach to the Bible, you are in rebellion. Because the Bible makes it very clear, you aren't supposed to remain shallow. You're supposed to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Peter spoke of shallow Christians, and here's what he said of them in 2 Peter 3, 5. He said, they are willingly ignorant of the truth. The Greek word willing there is the Greek word for simply an innate power of choice. <clears throat> the word is used on one occasion to refer to this, to move toward what one delights in. That's one use of that word, fellow. So shallowness then for a person regarding God's word is a form of deliberate rebellion. Peter says, willingly ignorant of the truth. Therefore, people who do not study God's word and use its meanings and context because they would have to admit to being a rebel. They would find out the real truth of the passage. So the question that we're looking at is, should we judge one another? Short answer is yes. <laughs> Long answer is these messages here. Uh, so the answer is already in the context of the Bible. We don't have to go looking for the answer. It's already there. So let's look, uh, number one, is going to be Matthew 7, 1 through 6. So I want you to look at that while we uh, analyze it. Matthew 7, 1 through 6, he says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rend you. Verse 6 is also often quoted out of context and misunderstood. Most people don't even realize that verse 6 is linked to the passage dealing with judgment. I'll show you why in a few minutes. So let's look at it. 
usually whenever people <clears throat> don't want to be judged, they say, judge not that you be not judged. And that's often followed with this statement. See there, the Bible says you shouldn't be judging me. So let's look at it. First of all, the person who says that to me just judged me. The statement is, in fact, an act of judgment. As soon as you tell me that you can't judge me, then that's a judgment. You're dealing with shallowness, a form of rebellion. So you can't reason from the passage with a shallow, rebellious mind. It just won't work. Number two, the verse is lifted from its context. Verse one actually raises a question, even though there's no question mark after it. Judge not that you be not judged. And so the question that's implied is this, how should we view judgment? And verse two begins the answer by starting off with the word for. So let's examine that context. Verse one, the word judge is crino, and the word was used often in the New Testament period, it was used of a, um, of a decision, a legal act. It was used to go before the judge, to hire an attorney and argue for a decision. And then the personal pronoun, that, the relative pronoun, indicates lest that or so that or because. So the whole idea here is he's trying to give us a picture of when judgment should be carried out. He says, be not judged is in the aorist subjunctive. He says uh, that you be not judged. And what does the aorist subjunctive mean? It simply means that judge knowing that you are to be judged by the same standard. That's the reason. You see, the Holy Spirit's a good grammarian. And he uses the proper grammar. He uses the proper tense to make the, the sentence say what it should say. So the principle that we draw out of that is you don't judge another person unless you're willing to be judged by the very same standard you're using on him. That's the concept. And number two, verse two, begins by actually clarifying that because it says this, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. So it clarifies verse 1. The first verse does not forbid judging as the proof texter wants us to believe. You shouldn't judge me. The Bible says judge not that you be not judged. What it does is it clarifies that the standard for the one doing the judging and the one being the judge is the same standard. That's the point. The word for indicates uh, a continual and explaining intensity of the argument. And then he says, with what judgment, indicating that the standard that you're using to judge, you shall be judged by the same standard. And, the, and, and with what, interesting phrase, continues the main point of that same standard. So it just keeps building the argument in favor of uh, if you're going to judge and you have to follow the same standard. Um, and then it notice, notice how it, it moves right into, into this, the second part of verse two. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Jesus is using an interesting word here. And we're living, in, we're not living in Europe where they use metrics, right? We're living, we still use inches and feet and all that, at least I do. But the word here is the word metron, which is the one from which we get metrics. So Jesus is talking here about something that is fixed, something that is absolute, and something that can't be challenged. It's an absolute standard. And then verse 3 begins with, And, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? The Greek word here for and is a little bit stronger than just a, a continuance. It carries with it the idea also, in addition, moreover, it's a reinforcement concept. It continues the main argument, but with additional support and stronger clarification. So Jesus is giving an illustration here to, to try to communicate to his disciples the principle that he just stated in verses 1 and 2. So in verses 3 and 4, he gives it. And this illustration is so simple that it is profound. And here's the picture. You've got a moat. 
in your brother's eye. A mote is a dried piece of straw, just a little speck of straw, or it can be a splinter from a piece of wood. And this, this friend has got it in his eye. And then what you have in your eye while you're going over to try to look at the speck in his eye is you're dragging this thing that's about 20 feet long sticking out of your eye that can be used as a support beam, okay? So he's trying to get uh, his disciples to see what he's doing here. The one person is judging his brother's splinter in his eye, all the while he's tripping over the support beam that's hanging out of his eye while he's trying to drag it around and go look into his brother's eye. And Jesus had a sense of humor, didn't he? <laughs> this violates the principle that the passage teaches. And that is, you judge others by the same standard that you will be judging. And he's going to come back to this, Jesus says, in just a minute. Now, verse 4 begins, or, and that indicates that he's reinforcing verse 3 by giving a second example. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. <laughs> so he's trying to get to see here in verse 3, the judgmental person is looking for the matter to judge, whereas in verse 4, he offers to deal with the matter that he sees in his brother's eye, but all the time he's dragging this thing around that's a bigger problem than what his brother had. So picture this. A man stumbling over a 20-foot long eye beam hanging from his own eye, and he comes up to this guy that had just a little splinter in his eye, and he says, you have a speck in your eye. Let me help you with that. Jesus says that, thou hypocrite. <laughs> and the word hypocrite, as you know, in verse, six, verse 5, thou hypocrite. The word hypocrite comes out of Greek drama, the word hypocrites, that means someone who was a performer on stage and sometimes he'd have to play two or three parts. So he'd be off stage, he'd put on this mask and he'd come out and recite the lines for that mask. Then he'd go back off stage, put that mask down, put another one on and come out and recite the lines for that. And Jesus is saying, he used this on the Pharisees quite often. What he's saying is they were actually involved in portraying different faces, you know, so he called them hypocrites. The person dragging around his beam ought not to think that he is capable of judging another man's speck. Jesus says, first cast out the beam in thine own eye. And the word first is very important here in the argument because there are a number of words that can be translated one, first, and that sort of thing. This is the word proton for, you know that sometimes in these uh, automobile industries when they're going to make a new uh, automobile, they'll do a prototype. Okay, that's what this is. In other words, it's the first, and then there are going to be more of them in the series, okay? And so he's saying here, first, in time or order, first in place, chiefly, or at the beginning, look at the big beam in your own eye and take care of that before you go and start working on somebody's spec. So self-judgment, here's what he's saying. Self-judgment should be the priority, the proton. Judge yourself before you think you're qualified to judge another. And the same standard should be used in both cases. So this is part of what people call the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. And that uh, begins, of course, back in the fifth chapter, verses 1 and 2, opens this way. And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So 5, 6, and 7 were the lecture that he gave them up on top of the mountain. Before I apply God's word to any area in anybody else's life, I ought to make sure that God's word is applied to my life in that very same area and in the very same intensity. Jesus said this, verse 5, Then, that if you do this, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So actually Jesus is focusing on two things here. If you want to be able to help another brother, and you should, you should be good at applying the word of God to your life and judging the things in your life that need to be dealt with, and then you'll be able to go and minister to the other brother by helping him judge the things in his life. 
So it's not a total condemnation. It's actually a picture of expanding your personal ministry, the idea. So Jesus does not forbid judging, as the proof texter says he does when he quotes it out of context. Rather, Jesus tells us how judgment should be carried out. And then the sixth verse is also part of verses 1 through 5, almost always overlooked. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest thou tr uh, they trample them under their feet and turn again to rend you. You see, judgment of wrongdoing is a holy process, and it deserves our respect at the same level that God respects. So if there is no judgment within a church family, then in the church anything goes. And we have some anything goes churches today. But Paul reprimanded the Corinthian church. You remember 1 Corinthians 5? He reprimanded them because they were allowing incest to be carried on in the church. Nobody had confronted the people involved and nobody had judged it. And so he writes to them in 1 Corinthians 5, 3. He's not even there, but he's heard about it. So I don't know how far away he was, but here's what he wrote. I have judged already. Here we have one of the men who wrote most of the New Testament. I'm judging. <laughs> he said, you people at Corinth are being judged by me because you haven't judged the problem. Now the question is, you, he uses the same word that Jesus does in Matthew 7, the Greek word krino. <clears throat> Should we judge one another in the Christian community? The Bible gives an overpowering answer of yes, but we're also advised to judge ourselves by the same standard that we seek to apply to others. And so if we judge ourselves, we set ourselves up to be able to help those who need to be judged and helped. Judgment is not looked at as a negative thing by Jesus here. It's looked at as a misused thing, but a holy thing. How do I know it's a holy thing? Well, look at verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast you your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. I've heard that misused and misquoted so many. But let's look at it in the context. He's talking about the process of judgment here. Accurate judgment identifies sin. Sin's always a problem. Accurate judgment offers an opportunity to the person judged to correct. And accurate judgment protects the church from corruption. Paul warned the church at Corinth. He said, don't you know that a little leaven leavens a whole lot? If you don't deal with this little sin, it's going to just going to go through the whole church. And then notice this, accurate judgment pleases God. So let's conclude with this concept. Jesus is not condemning judgment. He's actually approving it, and then he's giving guidelines not only for doing the judging, but preparing yourself to be more effective in ministering to somebody else in the church. So if judging is a holy and precious responsibility, he calls it holy and he calls it pearls. And then he said the right to judge sin in the assembly should not be entrusted to the wrong people in the church. And who would that be? The dogs and the swine. We're looking at it in the context in which it appears now. So you don't want somebody in the church who's living in incest judging incest. You want somebody who doesn't go along with that, somebody who stands on purity, somebody who wants righteousness in the church to be the one coming. And when judgment takes place, it also involves an attitude very much like the attitude Jesus had. Remember the woman taken in adultery? He did not approve her adultery but he did disapprove of the way it was handled. And then he told her, I'm not going to condemn you either. Go and sin no more. So he didn't approve the sin. He said, stop it. So we've got to look at the process of judging as a holy process, pearls. And we've got to look at those who are ill-equipped to be judges in the church. Looked at them as dogs and swine. That's what he said in verse 6. 
So I hope that gives you a little bit uh, of a picture of it. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll look at the Romans 14 passage, another one that's often used to say, don't judge. Let's stand for prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we love you. We thank you that evaluating conduct and judging sin and dealing with problems in the church while still loving people who are committing the problems is something that you've required us to do. So we ask you to help us to be loving, to be prepared, and to use the same standard that we hold others to and judge ourselves before we put ourselves in a position to judge. Speak to our hearts now as we open the altar in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>